Thank you, Isabella. Take your Bible to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Isabella, where are you at? There you are. Were you, were you scared? Uh, let, let me tell you something, okay? You, you just did something that 95% of the people sitting in this room would never do. I mean, I'm... I'm I speak to grown adults quite regularly, and I'll make a statement of something like, we'll, we'll get you up on the platform to do thus and so. And almost all of them say, uh-uh, uh-uh. So I, I want you to know, you, you just accomplished something. How old are you? Eleven. I wished I would have sang my first solo at the age of eleven. I was seven years later than, than that, so... So I honor you and I applaud you and thank God that you, that you blessed us today with, uh, with, with, with that song. Romans, the 8th chapter, the 28th verse, it's one, of, it's one of those verses that's very familiar. It's one of those that's familiar enough that a lot of people, you know, when you just holler out Romans 8, 28, they know what it says. But let, let me remind you of something about Scripture, and it's not just this Scripture, but it's all Scripture. Scripture must be learned, studied, and understood in context. Now what that means is, is we can't just pull a single verse of Scripture out of the Bible and apply it to just anything, any way we desire to do that. We have to do this in context. Now, to put this verse of Scripture in context. In fact, let, let's stand and go ahead and read it. Okay, let, go ahead and stand up so we, everybody knows what verse we're talking about. But here's Romans, here's Romans 8, 28, New King James Version. And it simply says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now here's the same verse, New American Standard. If you, th if you think that's of the devil, just do this, and I'll be through with it in just a second. But it says this, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, or for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now you can be seated. Now, when, when I talk about understanding this verse of Scripture in context, you'll recall that, that I, I got things out of order in, in our preaching order when, when I preached about the fact that we live in a fallen world. I preached that two weeks ago, and it should have been last Sunday. But it had, had it come in order, then, then I would be telling you that the previous... Are y'all hot? I bumped the... Uh, uh, somebody knows how to do that. Bump that down one degree. Anybody over here know how to work that thing? Bump it down one. It, it gets cold at the end, so I was trying to help you that way. So, but I, I see you all fanning, and so we'll we'll go ahead and bump it down. If it gets if it gets too cold, you can bump it back up. We may have a weather weather event in here at the time we get over hot and cold mixing together. And uh, but anyway, maybe maybe that'll help you. Now now the context would be this: is 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 the passage prior to this? That would be chapter eight. From about verse 15, or, or, or down from about, oh, oh I, I don't know what verse it is. I don't remember what our break was, but we, we talked about from verse 18 down through verse 27, we talked about the fact that we live in a fallen world. Now, we all agree with that? We live in a fallen world, and we deal with the circumstances and the consequences of living in a fallen world. Well, well, Paul just gets through talking about that fact and that we live in a fallen world, and he follows that with this verse. Therefore, we can't pull this out of just out of thin air and make it stick to the wall. But, but, but he gets through talking about the fact that we live in, a, that we live in this fallen world, and, and, and if you were here two weeks ago, then you recall that that our overarching truth with that message was this. Even though we live in a fallen world, the best is yet to come. Okay? 
The best is yet to come. Now, we get here to the 28th verse, and, and it also has to fit in context, not with just what's before it, but with what's after it, and we'll hit the what's after it in, in a little while. But he gets here to this 28th verse, and he's already established that, that we live in this fallen world, and, and then he makes this statement with this verse today. And we know that all things, now, the all things that he has primarily been talking about are, are not really all those good things. They're the things that, that, that we have to deal with in living in this fallen world. But yet we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called or are the called according to his purpose. Now, there, there was a, he, he's, he's dead now, but the late evangelist, his name was Ron Dunn, and Ron Dunn, he, he, he made this comment on this verse of Scripture. Let, let me just quote what he said. He said, quote, I've been looking for loopholes in this verse. I've read all the liberal commentaries, compared all the translations, studied the sentence structure and the word definitions in the Greek in an effort to find something wrong with this promise. In short, I wanted to prove that it doesn't really say what it seems to say. And then Ron, Ron Dunn said this, this is the verse I preached from three days after we buried our son who committed suicide. He said, I had preached it plenty of times before, but that didn't seem to count anymore. I've always believed that you don't have the right to shout praise the Lord at a funeral unless it's your loved one that's lying in the casket. End quote. And let me tell you long short what happened. God proved to the man of God, the evangelist, Ron Dunn, God proved to him and his dear wife that this promise is true. God proved to Ron Dunn in pretty extenuating circumstances that this promise is true. And it's not true sometimes. It's true all the time. It's true every time. There is not a time that this is not true. There is not a circumstance when this promise is not so. Now, the truth that comes out of this incredible promise, I, I'm calling it the most incredible promise maybe that God ever made, was this. This is our truth, printed on your outline. You can count on God to bring you out of the bad. You can count on God to bring you out of the bad. Now, I, I told you that we have to understand this verse in context, and we talked about what, what, hits, what has hit in Scripture before this, but, but, but it also has to fall in context with what's after it. And what's after it, it, it is this little passage of Scripture. If we, it, it's most recognizable when we get down to the 35th verse. And beginning in Romans 8.35, the Bible says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, now, now pay attention to this. Yet in some things, it's not some, it's not most, it's not 99.9. .9. He said, yet in all things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
And then he, then he said this, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's the deal this morning. Ready? The deal this morning is this. In Christ, we've talked about in and out of Christ several times over the past month or so. In Christ, if you're born again, if you've been saved, if you've been washed by the blood of Jesus, in Jesus Christ, we are eternally secure even when we go through bad times. In Jesus Christ, we are eternally secure even when we go through hard times. Now let's make this application of this scripture to your life and to mine. Here's the first thing I want you to notice about this, about this incredible promise that we find in the Bible. First of all, it is a confident promise. It is a confident promise. Now, look at the first three words of it. Depending on your translation, it may vary just a little bit. But in mine, it's these three words. And we know. We don't think. We don't assume. We don't presume. We don't hope. The Scripture says that we know. You say, well, Brother Steve, what, what, is the, what, is that, what does that word mean? Here's what that word know means. It refers to an absolute positive knowledge which one has beyond any doubt. I'm going to give it to you again. It is an absolute positive knowledge which one has beyond a doubt. Now, we, we, we have this knowledge. We know this kind of, kind of two different ways. Well, one way is we know this intuitively. And, and that's simply because the Holy Spirit, okay, the Holy Spirit has taught us, the Word of God has taught us, and the Word of God proclaims that all of these things that happen in our life, some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are easy, some of them are hard. Sometimes they're easy, sometimes it's a struggle. But the Scripture tells us that all things work together for good. Now, we know that because we have the Word of God. We know that intuitively because we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead. And we're told in Scripture that we can rest assured we know without any shadow of a doubt that, that we can know that all things work together for good. You say, well, Brother Steve, what difference does that make in my life? It makes this difference because we're able to know without any shadow of a doubt a positive knowledge which we have without any shadow of a doubt. What we know can change our perspective. Now, we all know this. We all know that we're going to have some heart. We've had some in the past. Some of you may be in the middle of it today. And if we're not in the middle of it today, we can pretty well rest assured if we live very long, we're going to be in it again. So we know that's coming. But can you, can you imagine how our perspective changes when, when, when we don't just know that these words appear on a page in our Bible, we don't just know that Romans 8.28 says these words and spells this out for us, but when we begin to know in our heart and in our mind and in our spirit that all of these things that, be, that, that come along in our life, that they work together for good, I'm telling you, brethren, it can change your perspective of things. You say, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. How can this change my perspective? Well, what, what, has to, what we've got to come to the place is, is we've got to know that this promise is based upon, it's not the character of Paul, which is good, but it's based on the character of God. It's based on the character of God who, who actually goes back and makes the promise in the first place. So think about this. What do we know about God? 
What do we know about some of the characteristics of God? We know God is faithful, don't we? Don't we? God is faithful. We know that God is truthful. We know that, that God has unlimited power. We know that God is sovereign. We know that God is full of grace and he's full of mercy. And we know that God is good, don't we? How many of you, the first prayer that you learned, like me, was a prayer that your mama and your daddy probably taught you? And it was a simple little old prayer. And mine went like this. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. I prayed that prayer till I don't, I don't know how long. But do you realize what that little prayer taught us about God? It taught us that God is good. And it teaches us or taught us that, that, that God is great. And, 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 and listen, Paul had confidence in the promise of God. Paul had confidence. Look, here's what he said in, in Philippians 1.12. Paul said this, he says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me... Now, he's speaking personal experience here. He said, The things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, Paul, when, when Paul said that, he's not speaking from something that he learned from the Holy Spirit intuitively. He's speaking of something that he learned experientially. And that is that, that he has come to the place in his life where he has experienced, where all of these different things that have happened to him up until this point in his life, they, they didn't seem good when they were happening. We know that Paul spent a lot of time in prison, don't we? Now, I've, never, I've never been on the other side of the bars, but I've been, I've been to a prison. And I've visited with people who were in prison, but I've never been in yet. Paul spent a lot of time there. We know that Paul was shipwrecked. We know that Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We know, that, we know that Paul was beaten on several different occasions, but then he comes along, and I'm not sure where this fits in chronologically in his life, but he makes the statement, and, and, and I believe it's a statement that he could have made on his last day on earth when he could have said that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I'm telling you this morning, Everything that happens in your life is not going to be good. Everything that happens is not going to look good. It's not going to feel good. It's not going to smell good. It's it, none of those things. But we can rest assured from intuitive knowledge, from the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that God takes all of these things that happen and he, and he puts them all together and they work together for good. Now let me remind you of something before we get in the bus and leave from this point. Good to you and me may not be the same good as good with God. You see, generally when we, when we make this, take this verse and we claim it, 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 it is we're, we're claiming it in the, in the aspect of, man, I need, I need some relief from this situation. I need some relief from this circumstance. Well, you know, that, that, that may not be God's good. I'm, I'm going to tell you what God's good is for us, and we're going to see this in a minute. God's purpose for you, if you're born again, God's purpose for you and God's purpose for me is to make us more and more and more and more like Jesus. His purpose is not so that we live a pain-free life. His purpose is not so that we live a, that, that we live a life that doesn't... Ex that, that's not His purpose for us. His purpose for us is for us 
to be the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So we have this confident promise. We know. It's not only a confident promise, though. It's a comprehensive promise. A comprehensive promise. Now, here's, here's the, the next section of that verse. We, we, we looked at the first part, and we know. But it, it, this is what comes next. That all things work together for good to those who love God. Now, let me read the American Standard, that section of the verse. And, and, and the, three, the, the three words that are, that are they're not really changed, but it, but it gives us a, a different insight here. And, and in the New American Standard, it reads that portion of the verse, and it says that God causes. God causes. Now, it, it, most of us go home this direction. And if you get on the loop and you're coming from the south side of town and, and you want to go around here to the 103 exit or the Nacogdoches exit over here, you're, you're going you're gonna to begin to hit some signs right back here somewhere. And those signs say, men at work, road construction, something along that line. I, I, I don't know what they're doing. I, I couldn't say that it's worth our money. and all, I, I, it, Maybe it's going to be. I, I, I just don't know. I don't know much about road work. I know we have a bunch of roads that need some work, but I don't know much about road work. Well, up here, they, 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 they've gone in. I've, I've noticed on the overpass up, up, up here at 103 and up, up in that area, that, and they've, they've taken down that old fence and the railing that was there, and I don't know if they're replacing it or putting a cement barriers there. I, I don't know what they're doing, but, but I know that every time we go through there, those signs begin to warn us, and I, I don't come from that direction very often, but I'm sure if you come from that direction, those same signs are there that say, Men at work, road construction. Well, think about this. In your life and in mine, there are times when, when we are swept up. We're swept up in heartache. We're swept up in pain. We're swept up in suffering. But I want you keep this in mind. Remember the first part, and we know, for we know. I'm telling you this morning that God is always and forever at work in your life. If, if his purpose is to make us more like Jesus Christ. Now we know one day that the Bible says one day we shall be like him. That day is probably not today unless he takes us to heaven today. But what he's in the process here, as long as we're living this life, and it doesn't matter if you're, how old, Isabel, I already forgot, 11? If you're 11, or where's Brother Palmer? Over here in his rightful place, 97 or 98. It doesn't matter where we're at. Whichever one of those numbers we're nearest to, I'm telling you that God is at work in your life. And he is at work to make you and to make me into the image of his son. Now, now when he talks about in this passage of Scripture that all of these things, he says all things. All things. Now, what all things means is this. It is utterly comprehensive, having no qualifications or limits. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're formulating in your mind, well, I'll get that preacher off to the side one day and I'll ask him about so-and-so. And then somebody else says, well, I'm going to ask him about so-and-so. And somebody over here says, well, I'm going to ask him about this. There's no need to ask. There is no need to ask. You say, why? Because the inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of our holy God cut out all the questions. When he says that God causes or that all things work together for good. John MacArthur, he wrote this, dealing with this thought. He said, he is rather attesting that the Lord takes all that he allows to happen to his beloved children, even the worst things, 
and turns, and turns those things ultimately into blessings. He goes on to say, no matter what our situation, no matter what our suffering, no matter our persecution, no matter our sinful failure, no matter our pain, no matter our lack of faith, in those things as well as in all other things, our Heavenly Father will work to produce our ultimate victory and blessing. MacArthur adds this sentence. He says, the corollary of that truth is that nothing can ultimately work against you, end quote. Now you say, Brother Steve, is, 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 is Paul saying here in this verse of Scripture, is he saying that whatever happens to us is good? No, it's not what he's saying. You say, is he saying that, that, that suffering and evil and tragedy are, are, are good? No, no. Is he saying that, that things just have a way of ultimately, somehow, mystically, magically working out? No, no. It's not what he's saying. You say, is he saying that we'll understand everything that God's doing in our life? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You see, this morning, and I started to do this, maybe I should have, I started to bring me a little table up here. And on this table, I could have had the ingredients to have made a pound cake. I don't know what all's in a pound cake. I, I, I know mostly what's in a pound cake. I jotted down on my list that there would be, there would be flour. There would be sugar, and, and, and there would be uh, eggs, probably uh, some vanilla, and what, whatever else goes in. And, and, and you think about this, outside of possibly the sugar, nothing that goes in that cake is good. Now, I've never sat down and eaten a teaspoonful of flour. Have you? If anybody in here had, I figure it's Keith Graves over here. <laughs> if he hadn't done it, I, I figure none of us have done that. Now, flour's not good by itself. I, d I don't think that just getting the, pouring you a teaspoon of vanilla flavoring, I don't, I don't know that'd be very good. But do you see what happens? When somebody comes in and they take that flour and they take that vanilla and they take that uh, sugar and they take all whatever else, the egg and maybe a little milk that goes in that thing and you, and you put it all together and somebody gets a whisk there out of the kitchen and they begin, some of you are going to tune me out because you're hungry and ready to have some pound cake from, from this point on. But we stir that thing up and, and then we turn on the oven to about 400 or so degrees, however hot you'd cook a cake. Is that too hot? Huh? Not hot enough? Down, 300 degrees. 350. You can tell I don't make many cakes. But you turn on the oven, you mix all those things together. Then you turn that oven on the desired temperature. You stick those ingredients in that pan in there and you leave it for 30 or 40 or however long you leave the cake in there, and then you go and you take it out of the heat, and you set it up there, and you let it cool a little bit, and somebody comes along and slices it, what do we have? We have something that's good. But to get that good in the finished product, you had to have a lot of things that were not good in and of themselves. And listen to me, brethren, God never even give the inkling of a promise that everything in your life or in mine would be good. The most incredible promise that I believe is given in the Word of God to Christian people is that all of those things just work together for good. And that's what happens in your life and in my life. The, the, the word together is an interesting word. 
It, it comes from the Greek word, I'm going to take a stab at it, synergio, synergio, or something like that. We get, a, we get a word from that. And the word that we get from that Greek word is the word synergy. I didn't know, I've heard the word synergy in my life, but I didn't know what it meant, but I looked it up, and here is the kind of the going definition. It means different things that work together to accomplish something greater than they could produce individually. Synergy. Different things work together to accomplish something greater than they could produce individually. Now, when I thought about that, I began to think about the life of Joseph. In the Old Testament, we, the, the life of Joseph is made up of a lot of difficult, trying, hard times in his life. Now, we're not going to take time to go back there and find it, but we know that he goes through a battery of hard times. His brothers hate him. They sell him into uh, slavery to the Egyptians or into Egyptian bondage. He's falsely accused by his new master. He's thrown into a dungeon. But eventually, through the providence of God, he, he, he comes to a place where he gains Pharaoh's favor, and he becomes the prime minister of the Egyptian empire. And, and then there comes this time of famine over the land, and, and there's no food, and all of those things happen. And, 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 and people have to come to him to get food. And guess who comes to him? those same brothers that hated him and sold him into bondage to start with. They came to old Joseph, and they didn't know who Joseph was. But there comes a time in that story in the latter stages of the book of Genesis, and in Genesis 50, 20, Joseph makes this statement to his brothers. He says, but as for you, and he could have pointed his finger and called every one of them by name. He said, as for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it. You know what's included in that it? All of those difficult things that happened in his life, they were the flour, the salt, the sugar, and the raw eggs that God put in that pan and stirred together and put in the heat of the oven and baked it. And Joseph said, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. I tell you this morning, you can trust God in the bad times. You can trust God in the difficult times. You can trust in His wisdom. You can trust in His sovereignty. You can trust in his power and bring all of those things that happen in your life to good. To good. You can count on God to bring you out of the bad. So it's a confident promise, we know. It is a comprehensive promise that all things work together. But it's also a conditional promise. Conditional promise. Here's the last part of, or one of the, section C of that verse. Section C of that verse says this, to those who, do you see that? To those who love God. Now, we, we have a word love. And, and, and we're kind of handicapped by our vocabulary and by our language because we can, some of you would stand up here today and you would say, I love pizza. See, the ones that wasn't carried away by that pound cake while ago, now you're really gone. Pizza. I love fried chicken. If, if there were one food that we had to eat every day for the remainder of our life, I'm voting for fried chicken. I can't eat it right now, but I'm voting for it. We, we, we say that we love a lot of things. We, we love our, and, and listen, some of you really do. You love your puppy. You love your kitties. 
And I, uh, that's fine. But I want you to understand that, that what Paul is talking about right here is not a love of fried chicken. It's not a love of an animal. In fact, this word love, here's what it means. It means to love unconditionally and sacrificially and consistently. Let me give it to you again. Unconditionally, sacrificially, and consistently. And, and I want you to note this about that. It is not written in the future tense, nor is it written in the past tense. It is written then, and it's still today in the present tense. You see, there's, there's a lot of people that profess to be Christians. And, and about all they can talk about is there was a day in my life when I was a teenager. There was a time in my life when I was a young adult. There was, there, there was this, there was that, but it, 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 it's not that way anymore. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He is talking about an unconditional, sacrificial, consistent love in our life, and it takes place day after day after day after day after day. It's not a sentimental. It's not an emotional feeling like we have if we, if we, we were playing golf the other night. And I, I'm not sure that Paul ever played golf. Or I don't know that he would have written this verse of Scripture to begin with, that all things work together for good. I, I just don't know. But the other night we was playing golf, and there was, there was some guys that were playing along with us. And, and, and one of them, he wound up a bit tipsy by the time we got through, but he, he wasn't with us. But, but he was with another group, and he wound up a bit tipsy, but he had a radio on his golf cart. And, and I noticed that through the, through the course of, of, of playing golf, and he's supposed to be quiet on the golf course, but he didn't read the rules. And, uh, and, and we were playing golf, and, and, and they would play a song that, that was popular when I was a, a, a young boy, a young teenager. And when I would hear that, it would, it would sort of be a sort of a sentimental sort of. You know what I'm talking about? Well, when, when, when Paul is talking here uh, about a love of God, he's not talking about something that used to be. He's not talking about something that the, this is the way that it was when you were 12 or when you were 9 or when you were 15 or whatever it was. He is talking about something, and, and this this promise being conditional is conditioned on the fact that, that your love of God is not based on something that happened 30 years ago, but it's based on what happened for, this, for you this morning, today, right now. Listen, I'm, I, I don't know if you know this or not. This is the only time in the entire book of Romans the only time, and, and Romans is a pretty lengthy book, but this is the only time in the book of Romans where Paul writes about the believer's love of God. Now, he talks about love a lot in the book of Romans, but every other time that he talks about or brings up the subject of love, he's talking about God's love for the believer, for us. But here he's talking about our love, for God. And you see, this love that Paul is talking about, that for we know all things work together for good to those who love God. This, this love distinguishes between the person who is a true born-again child of God and one who just professes to be a child of God. I read this the other day. I wish it could be my statement. I'd, I, would, I would copyright it. But the statement said something like this. There are many professors but few possessors. There are many who profess, but there are few who possess. 
I pray this morning that you're just not a professor, one who says, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm going to heaven one day. But I hope that today, I hope that you don't just profess him, but I hope you possess him. The Bible says in John 14, 15, it says this, if you love me. How many of you know what it says next? Keep my commandments. Now that's a part of the inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of the Holy God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Same chapter, verse 21, John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them. Listen to this. It is he who loves me. Not just the professors, but the possessors. It is he who loves me, and he who loves me. Wasn't wasn't that like a piercing arrow to some of our hearts today? He goes on to say, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And verse 22 says, Judas, not not Iscariot, said to Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered Judas and said to him, if anyone loves me, Are you ready for this? He will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we, and that we is, if you turned in your Bible, you find that we is capitalized. That we're still talking about God. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Romans eight twenty eight. It is true. It is true only of Christians. And I tell you this morning, I just have to go by the profession. If you were to say, Brother Steve, I know that I've been saved. Well, all I have to go on is what you say. But I want you to know this morning that God doesn't go by what you say. God knows It's not my promise that he will love those who keep his commandments. That's his promise, and he has the ability to know all of those things. I'm telling you this, this, this Romans 8, 28, it's true only of Christian people. But it's also conditional, those who love God. Now, look at the second part of that, and we've got to hurry. Here's the end of that verse. To those who are called according to his purpose. To his purpose. Now, God's calling. When God first begins to call on our life, it is always the call of salvation. Okay? That, that's God's call. Here, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit, it convi- can you recall this? The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. The Holy Spirit then clarifies the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit draws us to Christ for salvation. And the Bible says unless the Holy Spirit calls us or woos us, we can't come. So we can't just wake up in the morning and say, well, this is July the 16th. Good day to be saved. It don't work that way. The Holy Spirit calls and draws you to him. And and when that happens, we're redeemed. 
aren't we? We're saved. We're washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we know that one day, bless God, we're going to get to go to heaven. But that's not all that God wants to do. You see, most of you are like me, and you were saved. Some of you were saved weeks ago. Some of you were saved months ago, and many of you are like me. You were saved years ago. We could use the term, I was saved a lifetime ago. For, for me, it's been 37 years, and 37 years is more of a lifetime than a lot of people get. So I could honestly say I've been saved for a lifetime. But you see, he didn't just call me to save me. He's got a purpose for me. And his purpose for me is not just to pastor this church. It's not just to, to preach and to teach his word. His, his purpose for my life as a believer is found in the very next verse in Romans chapter 8. And here's what it says. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants you and me to be like Jesus. You hear me? God wants you and me to be like Jesus. That is his purpose. So somebody, there, there was a sculptor, and he had this large block of, I don't know what it was. We'll say it was granite. I don't know what you sculpt stuff out of. But it, it was just this big block. And he had a chisel and a hammer, and he was working away at it. And somebody walked in that room, and they said, well, well what are you making? He said, I'm making a horse. And he looked at that square block, and he said, well, how do, you, how do you know how to make a horse? He said, I just take my hammer and chisel, and I chisel away everything that doesn't look like a horse. God's purpose is to make you and me more like his darling son. And do you understand how he does that? He just begins to chisel away in our life Everything about us that doesn't look like, you got it, Jesus. Everything about you and everything about me that doesn't look like Jesus, he is in the process of doing away with it. And if we got this whole picture like I hope we do today, then we can begin to understand a little more in depth that all things really do work for good, work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Let me give you the greatest example of anywhere I know of Romans 8.28. It doesn't come from my life, and it doesn't come from any of yours. But it comes from the life of Jesus. And it comes from an event that took place at Calvary. It's the event that, that surrounded the event of, of all of the things that happened at the cross. And the things following. You see, Jesus was arrested. I've never been arrested, but I wouldn't think an arrest was very good. But some of you could say, I was arrested one time for something, and it changed my life and, and led to good things. Jesus was arrested. And Jesus, he, he began to go through all of these things. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was crucified, his death was painful, and his suffering was real. And, and I believe that when his death occurred, and, and when, when it come to that sort of a, a climax of that part of the story, that the angels in heaven may well have covered their eyes. We know that the Bible says that the sun which he hang in, hung in the sky, it refused to shine. 
The birds may well have hushed their singing. Yet God the Father took all of those bad things and he fashioned the greatest thing that any of us have ever known, the gospel. The gospel. I'm telling you this morning, it doesn't matter if you come from a good background or if you come from a hellacious background. God loves you. You didn't have to grow up in church. You didn't have to have a mom and dad that were Christians. You didn't have to have grandparents that were Christians. I'm telling you this morning, it's a blanket statement. God loves you. And He gave His Son to endure all of those things so that you could enjoy the good so that you could be saved. God took all of those things and he put them in that proverbial cake pan and stirred it up and put it in the hot oven and he pulled it out so that he could give us the greatest gift ever ever I tell you this morning Jesus is alive Jesus is alive and this morning Jesus offers you forgiveness of your sins he offers you a newness of life he offers you the opportunity to be a new creation I can't offer that to you It is not within my wherewithal. It's not within my ability. But I'm telling you, Jesus endured the bad to give you the good, and one day we'll receive the great. Eternal life. Will you believe Jesus today? Some of you might say, well, my mom and daddy didn't believe so I'm not asking you what your mom and daddy believed. I'm asking you, will you believe Jesus today? Will you believe Jesus today? We may never understand everything that God's doing, and we probably won't. But but we we can rest assured that he is going to take all of these things and turn them into something good for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. You see, if you're here today and you've never been saved, you may be sitting in your pew and you, you say, well, I'm just going I'm, I'm to wait this out. I, I'm, I'm just going to wait and see how things shake out. In the, uh, if, if that's you and you're not saved, this promise is not for you. If you are not saved, this promise is not yours. This promise is for those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. This this promise is for Christians and Christians alone, period. If you've been saved, He will take all the stuff of your life and He will make good if you'll allow Him to do so. Let's pray. Father, we ask you this morning, as we talked about on Wednesday night, may your spirit fall upon us in this time of invitation. Convict the lost that need to be saved. Draw them to you for salvation. Or speak to the heart of those of us who are Christians, but we haven't been loving you and serving you like we should. Convict our heart and draw us back to you for a new walk of obedience this morning. Have your will and your way in this invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.